it's Debussy's Reverie, um, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, it's uh, it's one of his best loved works, I would say, along with the Arabesque and Claire de Lune. Um, which is funny, really, because he didn't think a lot of it. Um, he didn't even particularly care about it when he wrote it. He wrote it purely to earn money. And he was almost annoyed uh, by how well it did uh, and how in demand it was. I guess that's... I mean, Debussy was a tricky man uh, in some ways of his personality, but I guess that's also the idea that his musical language evolved so far beyond this piece that probably looking back it seemed to him very immature and juvenile um, because the Debussy of the Impressionist era of swirls of abstract sound and colour is not this. But that doesn't make this any the less, less special for it. Um, reverie means daydream. Uh, and I might just explore a few of the ways that I think he helps us get lost in ourselves in this piece. Um, so even if we take the very beginning and the opening introduction in the left hand. I think it's very cool that we're doing this alongside the Chopin because he's not doing a dissimilar thing to what Chopin was doing. He's depriving us of the main beats of the bar and he's instead giving a little bit of weight to some of the weakest parts of the bar. So now we're going one, two, three, four. So we would expect it to be one, two, three, four. But he's not giving us anything on three, like not even a note at all, or on one, other than the first note of the piece. So we get this, one, two, three, four, one, three. And when I take away the counting, That's how immediately, just from such a simple introduction, he makes us feel lost in time and space, because we don't know where we are. Um, we're also in F major, uh, apparently. You certainly wouldn't know it from that intro introduction where he starts in G minor. Um, and although we haven't had a reference point yet, um, because he starts in what we call a first inversion chord, we feel very uncertain. So G minor should be like this. As soon as we play it like this, feels a little bit more airborne. And uh, that's again, not a coincidence. And he does this incredible thing at the beginning where he starts in G minor, then shifts everything down one space, one more, and then we're home in our F major. And so the beginning, what is it, eight bars, feels like this suspended in time introduction while we just gradually almost like someone going under hypnosis. The first eight bars, you're slowly going, and then on the eighth, you're there, you enter the parallel universe. Um, a little kind of geeky aside is that he starts with this very nice, famous melody. But actually it's rather ingenious because those first two notes, is just the flip, is just the mirror image of the top of the left hand accompaniment. So he's kind of already prepared us subconsciously for the opening melody. And so that when it comes in, it doesn't feel alien. It feels like it's a tune we've heard before. Genius, genius uh, tactic. Um, what else could I say? Uh, there's a, there's a, a clear uh, second theme, um, which is here. Now again, this isn't a theme that is totally alien to us, right? In the main theme, We've had this raising, rising scale figure, and so, what do we get here? He flips a mirror image on it again. And we have a falling scale figure that then does rise back up. So everything, rather like maybe a daydream, everything is kind of interconnected. And have we heard it before? And where really am I? Just incredible. Uh, the, next, the next important moment, I think, to, to draw your attention to is the first time in the piece where these rippling quavers stop. So we've had constant... 
kind of flowing, rippling, and then suddenly. becomes incredibly what we call homophonic, so when all the notes are moving at the same time it becomes very blocky and much more vertical actually, whereas before we've been travelling very horizontally. I don't know what exactly is in his mind here. To me it feels a little bit like this could be us starting to wake up, this starting to return to reality. Like a, a far off sound in the distance reminding us of reality. And then what he does with it, is he lets that happen one more time. And then... He uses it to change key to a totally unrelated key. He's like, nope, I'm not ready to wake up yet. We're gonna go here. And from F major, we go to E major. And there's, there's barely anywhere less. Well, I say F major, sorry, we're in D minor here. And then we go suddenly to E major not a very connected key at all. And we dream some more. And then the opening comes back and leads us right through to the end when this melody does come back again, much heavier and darker. And what key is that in? That's in G minor. So that's exactly where we started the piece. So again, just another incredible device to tie it together. So we wonder why these pieces are so famous. Why is Debussy's Reverie so famous? Why does everyone love it so much? It's not coincidence. It's these, these genius compositional devices that we're not aware of when we listen to it, unless someone like me has just spilled the beans, but, uh, but has an effect on us to make us spellbound. Marvellous piece of music. This is for Mark. Not your first request my friend. Maybe not your last, but uh, you keep requesting such beautiful pieces that what am I going to do? This is with much love for you and Anton.